another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I'm your host and relationship expert, Spicy Madi, and joined with me in the G-Spot today for an amazing episode is Jamila Osuna. Give it a round of applause. Yes, the crowd goes wild. So <laughs> Jamila is a longtime friend, okay? And um, I've been, uh, had, I've had the privilege of seeing your career grow. Thank so you, super man. excited because she's coming in on today's episode to talk about relationships in the public eye. She is a public relations expert and she's going to tell us how to make the public fall in love with you. Yay! Okay, so Jamila is the vice president of Ali Moxie, a division of Ali Global Marketing in her current role. She leads a team of 20 marketing and publicity professionals across eight offices. Her goal is developing a voice that speaks to diverse consumers, and she has over 14 years of experience in marketing and public relations. Mrs. Asuna has worked on national campaigns, corporate and lifestyle launches, and she prides herself on a get-it-done approach and credits that for being a catalyst for success. Throughout her professional career, she has fostered meaningful business relationships with returning clients and opened doors to new business development and lasting mentorship. Most recently at Ali Moxie, she creates and executed integrated Activisions for top film campaigns, including Black Panther, Hidden Figures, Deadpool, Logan, The Fat, The Fate of the Furious. I keep wanting to say Fast and Furious, but it's The Fate of the Furious. I did see it. It's the same. <laughs> La La Land and Dear White People on Netflix. Shout out to Netflix. Uh, pushing them to major box office success by creating a voice that speaks authentically to the diverse audience. She has leveraged her expertise to push people, projects, and campaigns forward, and she looks to continue to grow and work in the space she loves so dearly. Whew. Whew. Okay, this accomplished bio. <laughs> but I got there. I got there. I'm sorry. Like, when, when you have a friend who is doing amazing things, you got to celebrate it all. And uh, I'm so proud of you and all your accomplishments and had to have you on the show because when we think of relationships, we oftentimes think of dating relationships. We think of, you know, maybe family relationships, but we don't pay enough attention to our relationships in the public eye. Mm -hmm. So... I always warm up our expert guests with SPICY, which stands for self, passion, intimacy, <laughs> communication, and learning to say yes. So, Jamila, you got to answer this very spicy question first. When did you first fall in love with yourself? Ooh, that's a question. Um, man, I think I, uh, there are places where I feel like I fell in love with myself in bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Um and holistically, I might have fell in love with myself after I had my son. Oh my gosh. Holistically. And that was just like six months ago. Right. Holistically. But um, I would say like bits and pieces, I've started to fall in love with myself from my early 20s. And then again, in my like early 30s. Like so when there's I'm, been a progression of a love. progression, yeah, of love. Yeah. Answer this very hard to answer hot topic question. Did you fall in love with a man first before you fell in love with yourself? No. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Look, she said that confidently because you know we have a lot of women who are like, yes, I was in love before I really loved myself. No, I wasn't. <laughs> loved herself first. Okay. <laughs> Next, how did you discover your life's passion? Um, I think that I kind of fell on it um, because I've always been... Um, even when I was in like high school and like even junior high school, I remember like it was those instances where I always had like a lot of girlfriends mm -hmm. and I just was like a girl's girl. And I like did all those things like dance class and like cheer squad and like just all those super girly things. But so I had always had a, a collective of women around me mm. and young girls around me. And I always felt like I needed to make us better yeah. or I needed to, um, host something in my house <laughs> or my parents' house at that time. So I always was that person who kind of like wanted to like, kind of like help lead the team. Hmm. So I think that it kind of just developed into, um, you know, I, I didn't start out to to want to be a publicist, honestly. I did what did not. you first want to do? I, at, first, at first when I was in college, when I went to college, I thought that I wanted to be um, a journalist. Okay. <laughs> And specifically a sports journalist. Oh, Like, okay. I wanted to do, like, sports... Like, I wanted to be, like, Jamil Hill. Like... Mm. And I didn't really get into sports, which is why I don't know why I thought that I wanted to be... <laughs> You're not a huge sports fan. I'm not a huge sports <laughs> fan. And I never was. So I just didn't Girl, understand... Girl, did you want to be around the athletes? What was it? I think that maybe... <laughs> because I was so sheltered when I was, like, in high school. Because I always went to performing arts school. And it was always just, like, a, a lot of women around me. Yeah. Like, maybe I just wanted to try something different. I don't know. But um, I got to college, I went to Howard, and I got a chance to do it. 
and I was like the host for the football game. Ooh, look at you hosting. And it was really cool. And we did like packages that we had to like produce them. And like I spent my whole weekend in like the editing suite multiple times. And I was like, I don't want to do this. Oh, yeah. My whole college career. And then I just realized that I also didn't really enjoy being in front of the camera as talent mm -hmm. because I always had too much to say. Oh, you're like, I have an opinion. Right. I need to be able to express it. Yeah. And they kind of took away your like producers. Like it's their package, yeah. you know, unless you are lucky enough to produce your own stuff. So I realized that that really wasn't for me. And I don't like makeup and I <laughs> <laughs> like and all of that. So it just was, you know, I, but that's why you have to have experience or at least try to gain some type of experience or at least exposure to what it right. is that you think you want to do. So that yeah. way you can either go full throttle with it or eliminate it and on to the next. So then I, I fell on to being a publicist first by being a talent publicist for um, I was working at a like a, a really big um, radio company called Clear Channel, and I was oh, doing yeah, corporate Channel. communications, <laughs> um, which was like not really my dream job either. But I had a girlfriend who was a producer on a television show that had just launched like BT 106 and Park. Like, so there was a bunch of talent that was new to the city, and I was like the New Yorker. Like, I knew all the parties to go uh -huh. to and how to get on the list and all that stuff. So, um, she had like, a baby and she still does know how to <laughs> get on the list and where the parties are at. <laughs> so, um, but I don't go anymore. So. <laughs> um, so anyway, so my friend was just like, hey, can you just help this girl out who um, is now my best friend, um, Alicia Renee. And shout out to Alicia. <laughs> she was like, can you help her out? She has a new show. She's new to the city. Like, can you like help get her into places or whatever and I and I did and we just bonded and mm -hmm. had like a really great relationship and we both learned about like being in an entertainment business together and like um what it means to be a publicist and I think that I just felt like after that it was honestly my calling and I within a year maybe two years after that my boss at that time was like um it's not working out here <laughs> because I spent so much time like working on getting her things at my desk that oh. it was it was like I was like totally not bashful about it at all like I would go on two hour lunch breaks and be like I'm going to do something right now and I'll be back and I'll come back with like gift bags from like events and stuff and they'll be like where were you and I'm like uh, I had to go I had, do some PR I had to go do some PR on the side right so my, um, my, my boss at that time, he was like, um, I think that corporate is not for you. I think that you are made for something bigger. And mm -hmm. I envision you being like a publicist for JLo or working a red carpet for something bigger. So I think you should just figure out like what it is that you want to do and leave here. But it sounds like you're <laughs> making steps to get closer and closer. Like you were realizing along the way, yeah. like where your path you know should be like you were walking down yeah. that journey you didn't ignore you were listening to the signs i was i mean i had a great time i was really just having a lot of fun and it, it just kind of pushed me into a way that um was beneficial for my career um so yeah so i kind of got fired after <laughs> <laughs> two or three months after him telling me that he, i had time to find another job and then he was like no this is over now so you have to leave. So. But that was a blessing in disguise, and it though. Was. It was. It literally was a blessing because now I had so much time and people had seen what I had did for her. So now people were coming to me and were like, hey, can you take on this athlete? Hey, can you take on this foundation? Hey, can you like fly to Atlanta and do something here? Can you go to Houston? Like, And then like the f next three years of my life, like I would spend working with Alicia and mm -hmm. athletes and the Chiefs and um, all these like amazing people and I really had a, a wonderful growth period um, from knowing I didn't want to do corporate communication to where it is now. But um, you still are in communications though. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's all related. All of it sounds like that it helped gain experience in yeah. guiding you. And when you walk in your purpose, the universe will start to listen. Like it will start to answer and reveal more and more to yeah. you. And it was really scary at first is that I've, I always was very regimented and organized and you have to have a day job and you have to do this mm -hmm. and really just to step out on faith and say hey you know 
I'm actually not going to go find another job. And the stock market has crashed. (laughs) Like, it literally is when, like, everything was bad and people were, like, losing their homes. And I'm like, now I don't have a job. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, you know, I did, we did great things. And I worked with Lance Gross and we worked with Hennessy and we worked with all these people. And, I mean, it just was an amazing experience. And then, um, then I got tired of chasing talent around (laughs) and I said I still wanted to work in talent I still wanted to work in entertainment and um, I still loved working in television and film and how can I do that and not have to give my whole life yeah you know so because it is a sacrifice it's a sacrifice and you know parts of you you can't get back and that's your time like you know you can't time away from your family time to build your family and I knew that that's not what I wanted for the long term of my life. So how can I work in the industry that I love, but still mm. have it on my terms? So that's where I am now. You created a whole nother lane for yourself, <laughs> yeah. but you created value along the way so that you could, when you were ready to pivot, make that transition. Yeah. So I love this. So now you're going to have to start giving us like insight into how to get the public to fall in love with you. Since you are an expert at this, you got clearly clients to fall in love with you companies to fall in love with you. Now you're going to tell us how to do that same, right? Because right. part of the reason why I thought that Jimmy Lee would be great for this episode is because I definitely was one of those friends that were like, can I pick your brain a little bit? You know, that text that you're like, dang it, she's about to ask me for some free advice. Um, I get that text <laughs> all the time. But she was started giving valuable tips and insight that I was like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't just be knowing this. Like the world needs to know this because oftentimes we get discouraged when it comes to promoting ourselves or you know parading what yeah. makes us amazing but you do that for a living you highlight what makes people amazing and draw attention to that and you created an entire profession around that so you got to tell us how do you build a relationship out of thin air um i would say first really understand what it is that you want your image to be and your product that you're giving and what it is that you think it's valuable Mm -hmm. you know what it what is your story like people are really interested in um understanding how your story connects to something in them like what 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 heartstrings are you tugging on at Mm -hmm. that moment like what are you giving and it's and i feel like sometimes people think it's all about like what they can get from the public but Mm -hmm. it's like what can you give to them that they can feel like they have to invest in you because you're giving something to them are there, are there specifics of what the public wants? Or is it based on, like, what your specialty is or what it is that you're trying to promote? Because how do you know what people are interested in or what, pe- what the world wants when you're just starting off? That's a really interesting question. And there's no real answer to that because there's something for everybody, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that it's really just finding out that group and that lane of people, of people who want what you want to give. You know, so don't feel like, oh, I have to fit into this niche group of of people that should be interested in me. Maybe that's not your group. Right. You know, maybe you should be talking to a different set of people. So it's knowing Um, your audience, knowing who your target demographic is, it sounds like. Yeah. And that's kind of what we do every day. Right. Like I work on TV shows and, and film and entertainment and we try to figure out. Who is the audience that wants to go see this show? Yeah. Or who's the audience that's gonna like tune in weekly? And you 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 kind of build and and I'm it's a little bit of techno <laughs> at the center circles, right? So who's my core group? Who at the at the center, who do I need to reach? Existential right? circles. Yes. Who is at the core of who's where I need core? to reach? Okay. And then you build on there. Okay, now how do I reach a broader audience of the outer ring of people who who would be interested in something. Okay, and now how do I build on that? How do, how do I build mass appeal on that? And so it really should start with your center, mm-hmm. your core group, right, of people who would be interested in something that you have to give, right? Something that can connect to them, likenesses. And then you build out from there. People, I think, kind of approach it well, oh, I have to have this mass interest from people yeah. immediately, when that's not necessarily the way that that's, the most effective. Well, isn't that what we think? Oh, I need a publicist. This is why I need, you know, a publicist so that they can promote whatever it is that I'm doing or wherever right. it is that I'm going or whoever it is that I'm seen with. What is exactly 
public relations and its purpose? And do we really need it? Um, I always think that, and I know that other publicists will hate me for saying this, <laughs> <laughs> but there are things that you can do that a publicist does on your own and that you should do on your own first, right? One, it's, unless you really have the money to afford a publicist, um, you're going to get someone who, if, if you go after a cheap publicist, you're going to get cheap ass results. Mm, right? You get what you pay for. You get what you pay Spicy for. You really right do. Um, but if you don't have the money for it, then you should really be focusing your capital on something that's going to help you grow your business first before you go after going after a mass consumer. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would say, and I think I told you this, like, look at things that you can do on your own yeah. first, like get your house in order, <laughs> you know, like really get your house in order first. Understand really what your messaging mm -hmm. is supposed to be. What are you going after? Craft that on your own because it should be your message, yeah. right? It should be really what your dream is. Yeah. Um, then do things like look up who you want to talk to. You know, who are your audience groups? Are there influencers who focus on that? And that's just a Google search. Right. Like, that's taking some time to go through Instagram or Twitter or whatever have you and find these people who speak to what it is that you want to market to, right? So that next tip is research. If you guys aren't paying research. attention, research. Do, Do some your research. work. Do some work. <laughs> um, and then, like, in terms of publicists, you know, they pitch stories, right? You read magazines. Mm-hmm. You read the internet. Blogs. You read mm -hmm. the blogs. So you should actually know before you go to a publicist what magazine, where you want to be placed. Yeah. Right? You should have an idea. Like where you can see yourself fitting, right. where that audience lives, where your best, yeah. You, bet. At least you should know what your competitive landscape is. Oh, for sure. Right? Know your competitive, yes. So if you are a relationship expert and you want to like market to African-American women, you should know who the editors are in the relationship section. Of Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Who are the ones who are talking online about relationships for those particular, and it's right there. It's in black and white. So are you saying if I want to get exposure in essence, just email the editor that's on the blog or that's on the site? I wouldn't say that that's going to always get you a response mm -hmm. because they get a ton of emails, right? But you can do an introductory and say, hey, offer your services. This is about goes back to giving, right? Yeah. If you're looking for an expert to, you know, to talk about so-and-so and so, here's my information. Yep. I'm an expert here. I'm available to you if you ever need somebody to be a resource. Be a resource. I think, I think that's brilliant. Ask or volunteer to be a resource as opposed to like, can you hook me up? Um, ask, can I hook you up? How can I right. provide additional, you know, services or value to what it is that you're doing? That is brilliant and amazing. And actually, after Jamie had mentioned this to me, I went and did that. I've already been, in essence, shout out to the spicy life. But mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, I reached out to Exo Nicole, who um, does a lot of relationship stuff. And I reached out to Nicole directly and was like, I think I can contribute on um, some expert advice and matchmaking when it comes to your audience. And she's like, oh, amazing. We actually need that. Here's my, you know, editor in chief and here's her email. And I'm sending in an article exactly. like, but, but I also too, in order to get that information or maybe didn't even like think directly to do that, asked a friend for some solid advice. And then I followed through with it. You didn't just, it didn't just go in one ear. I followed mm -hmm. through with it. Yay, I'm so <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> That's so awesome. Pat self that really back. makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and if people don't have the contact information for a Hello mm -hmm. Nicole, people really respond to people on DM. Yeah. You know, sometimes insert yourself in the culture of I guys. Be part of a conversation that they're having on their platform and say, hey, introduce Ooh, yourself. Ooh, that's you know? one I don't think that people have thought about. Yeah. Like, get a part of a conversation. So on social media, if there's like, something that's going on like leave comments and stuff like that in that too yeah leave comments send a dm send a reference link send something that says hey i have some information that you can have that might make you look better or help your audience or whatever have you like they're always looking for more content but what about the person who feels like oh i've already sent 18 dms and no one's replying 
what would you tell them when they're losing hope? Keep at it. Maybe try somebody else. <laughs> you know? Spicy tip. Yes. Yeah. Move on to the next. On to try the next. Keep else. going. Don't give up. Yeah. Just on to the next. Just like with dating, okay? <laughs> you don't stop just because one person didn't work out. That's true. Very true. Maybe try a smaller outlet. Maybe you're, you need to start to build your own repertoire a little bit more. Barking up the wrong tree. Before, yeah. Yeah. Because everybody, I mean, you've been on television and everything. Everybody can't go directly to Essence. Sometimes they have to start with like upscale, you know? So. Yes. But regardless is you're saying still you have to try, like you have to attempt. Yeah. You know, our, we can't operate from a, pr a place of one, pride and ego, but also two, entitlement. Yeah. Just because you are talented and amazing or just because you think that you are deserving and you've worked so hard doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna happen overnight. And you gotta put in the work just like a multitude of people who have had to time and time again. Absolutely, absolutely. What other tips? So you said social media, you said um, reach out, like uh, you can be doing like promotion, figure out, you know, yourself mm -hmm. and your promo first, like your story. What else could we be doing? Create um, a need and like a, a niche in your own community, right? So generate buzz in, within your immediate network, you know, host something at your house or... <laughs> You guys, she is dropping nuggets right now. I hope you are listening to this. This, this. this is million dollar advice that she's dishing to you for like free 99, okay? Yeah. Uh. But I think that we underestimate the power of us even putting on events or hosting stuff. Mm -hmm. You're saying actually create a community, gather yeah. people who would be interested in this together and showcase whatever it is for them. Right. And it doesn't have to be like an over the top thing. People really are very giving to things that are, that are even simplistic. You know, like maybe it's not, maybe you don't have the best house to host something in, but maybe you get a, like a, a small room at like a local lounge or something. Like, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to be something that's directly coming out of your pocket. Negotiate with the lounge to say, hey, I'm gonna bring in customers here, give me a discount, you know? So it could, it could be something that's really inexpensive at the same time, so too. You're saying try to, I like that you're using the word negotiate because it, now it sounds like we have to be a little business savvy with it too. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people have a problem with feeling like they're asking for handouts, feeling like, well, I don't want to bother my friends because you know they may, they may have access to this or they may have influence to this, but I don't want to ask them for the homie hookup or I don't want to ask this building if I can use it for a discounted rate because you know I don't want to look you know like I'm in need or I'm begging. What would you say to those people? You're a fool. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I work with some of these biggest, the biggest, studio, the, some of the biggest budgets of film and TV shows that you can imagine. She's talking milli millies, right? Not hundred thousand milli millies. They are all very cost conscientious. Like they're not going to just give me a, a, a black car and it'd be like, Jamila, go spend whatever you want to spend. Why not? You're deserving of it though. I am. <laughs> However, they're deserving of having a bottom line too. Exactly. You know? So if you want to protect your bottom line, then you shouldn't spend everything on trying to launch something, right? You should figure out ways that you can leverage your relationships, leverage the things around you that will help you propel where you need to be without costing you an arm and a leg, right? It's the same thing that these mega million suit, they're not gonna spend everything, mm -hmm. right? They're gonna send me to go and negotiate. Right. They're gonna send my counterparts to go and negotiate. Because a lot of us get stagnant behalf. though when we think about the financial constraints to it, where we remain stagnant because we're like, well, I can't afford that right now, so I'm just not gonna do it. Like, you know, right. they have that money for that big production or they have that money to put on, you know, that made that huge event. I don't have that money yet, so I'm just gonna wait. I'm just gonna put it off until I have enough money to do it. Yeah, that's why you do something within your own means. Like, if you can't go to a lounge, you host something in your living room. You know, if you can't do it in your living room, then go to the library. Yeah, it's just a meetup. You got to get creative with it. Yeah, and I also think it speaks to well, how bad do you want it? Because one, you're right. gonna keep putting it off, so you don't want it that bad, and you don't need it that bad right now. And yeah. then two, if you don't do it at all, you're also operating from a place of fear and using excuses to control you. Yeah. So how bad do you want it? Because you putting into motion will show and you will start to see that people are receptive to it. I started off hosting small events before I started throwing major events for my company. And it started off with just a few friends and then grew yeah. and grew and grew. But had I not started at all, it wouldn't have grown. Mm -hmm. Like I do a speed dating event called March Matchness 
And when it first started, people were like, speed dating, playing games, I don't really know. And so, okay, well, friends, just come out and support me. Like, just right. come out and support. Then it, you know, it turns into, okay, well, now bring another friend and bring another friend. And word of mouth grew, but it wouldn't have happened had I not even tried. Because I was nervous. I was like, mm -hmm. well, I don't have 100K to spend on a fantastic event. Right. You're really dropping, like, gems right now. <laughs> and you shouldn't spend 100K. <laughs> <laughs> somebody should somebody, was it within should my have budget a sponsor anyway. coming there <laughs> and spend 100k for you tell us that how yeah. do we get sponsors how do we get people to support you or um brands like that to support you when you may not be as famous as a celebrity or a film that you you know represent how would right. you how would you go about getting a, a hennessy or getting um a you know a start to sponsor an event well that's a little more tricky right because that becomes like part of relationships and mm -hmm. leveraging relationships those too. relationships to like say, hey, um, you may not give me $50,000, but I know you have $50,000 in product that I can use that's going to save me $75,000 because I'm not going to pay for a bar, you know, so. Um, but they want to know what's in it for them. How do you tell, how do you let them know, just like how you told us earlier, like provide a service, how do you approach them and let them know what's in it for them? I mean, normally, like, on that kind of level, it's something where um, it has to be very sexy or it has to reach a target consumer group or um, it has to have legs that will live beyond it, so social or some type of publicity coverage that's going to come out of it um, that can be pretty much guaranteed. So um, that's a little bit more high level um, if you are looking for something like that. How did something go social or mainstream to get buzz and attention? If you think about the free advertising that Popeye. Popeye's got. I was going to say, are you going to talk about Popeye's? Yes, I want to know, Miss <laughs> PR expert, how do we recreate that for ourselves or for a company the way that Popeye, because let me tell you, the lines at Popeye were empty for a while before they were. this whole buzz and Chick-fil-A battle or beef. How do we create that for ourselves? How do we get something to go viral or get something to get us $30 million worth of free advertising like Popeyes did? See, that people have really been trying to figure that out, right? It's a little bit of um, a fluke, right? And it's a little bit of something that um, sometimes when you get into the cultural zeitgeist, mm -hmm. and that's a word that they use a lot in marketing sphere. Say it again. Cultural zeitgeist. Cultural zeitgeist, okay. We're giving you that vocabulary words. it's part of like the culture now, right? Um, and then things just spiral, right? Same thing that happened with like, um, do you remember Straight Outta Compton? Oh yeah. And the Straight out of. Now, that was a genius marketing yeah. idea, right? One of the most successful marketing ideas in a film campaign, period. Oh, wow. But the Popeyes, I would be really interested to know if that was actually a marketing company that put mm. that in there. or Just letting us think that it was organic and really right. you guys spun something. And my gut is telling me that it probably was, right? My gut is telling me that it probably was a placement where... The campaign was, we'll go into the culture of Zygase. We know that people love Chick-fil-A. We know that Chick-fil-A loves going up against other people, <laughs> right? The same thing happened Bring with, it like, Chick-fil-A Chick went houses. against Wendy's. Remember, <laughs> Wendy's had said something about yes. their chicken nuggets or something like that. And so Chick-fil-A is in that position, right? They say that they're, like, the best chicken in town, right? So what happens when you go against, like, the best, right? Like... How do you get into that culture? It's almost like when you challenge a boxer that you like the heavyweight and right. you think that you can take it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we just had to show some love to our spicy sponsors and we are back. We're talking with Jamila about how to make the public fall in love with you. Uh, I, you see how I avoided saying your last name because I didn't want to mess it up. Jamila <laughs> Osana. Osuna. Osuna. Dang it. I keep doing it. Jamila Osuna, okay? She's gonna forgive me. I still wanna call okay. her Cummings, but I gotta I know, get I gotta I get used to it. I have a problem. I have all my best friends still saved in my phone by their maiden names. Like every single friend. In my you phone. know what? I think I still have you as your maiden See? name also. So I'm gonna I, you know, I'm I'm also still getting used to it. Sometimes I still spell it wrong. I mean, it's it's only been a year. Yeah. So I forgive you. It's, it's okay. <laughs>
It's okay. I need the love. I need the love. Yeah, because people are always like, how do you spell what? Like, pe people forget my new last name, and I always go by Spicy Mari. So, but names are important. How important is it memorizing names in the industry when you're meeting someone for the first time or trying to build a relationship, and you don't remember their name, and you see them again, and you're like, oh, yeah, hi. Uh, Girl. Whatever their name is. Tell me, talk to me about names. I'm terrible at that. I need people to take do it better. personal. They do. But I always say that even if you don't know who, who it really is and you don't really have a clear you know, recognition of who that person is, act like it's like one of your best friends and you're so excited to see Treat them. Treat special anyway. Yeah, because one of my mentors told me a long time ago, people remember how you treat them, mm -hmm. right? So even if you like really only spend a very short amount of time with them, if you treat them good and they remember that you were like really nice yeah. and like just giving or whatever have you, they're going to remember that even if they don't remember your name or your face. And I feel like that sometimes happens to me where people remember that, oh, she was nice to me or, mm -hmm. you know, that's a nice lady. And they not, might not remember my name, but they remember my face. And I may not remember theirs either, but I always fake it. Spicy tip. <laughs> people don't remember what you say. They remember how you made them feel. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, she is dropping nuggets about how to improve your relationships within the public eye, how to get the public to fall in love with you. Uh, this will also help, too, with personal relationships because uh, we also, too, when we're, like, dating or we're, you know, we, like, in a situation with spinning, I want you to talk about spinning. How do you spin a story and make us fall back in love with you after you have fallen out? This is kind of like a make a breakup for some of you relationship um, people that make right. a breakup. How do you break up with the public and then make up with the public? Well, um, sometimes you have to fall on a sword, right? Um, we've seen that a couple of times, and I've had a couple of clients where it was like a particular actor might not say the most favorable thing, mm -hmm. you know, but they're going to be in the next show. So we kind of have to like fall on the sword right now. Mm -hmm. So people like me again. And um, I think it's always okay to apologize. You know, it's, it's definitely okay um, to apologize and to acknowledge that you were wrong or um, and see, and make it seem and not seem, be empathetic. Mm -hmm. Don't make it seem empathetic. Be empathetic and be authentic with your apology because people see through it if it's not. Um, and then at that point, move on. Um, like we saw that with Kevin Hart. I was just thinking that. Yeah. I'm like, and Dave Chappelle just did a whole like <laughs> comedy special on Netflix where he's talking about like Dave Chappelle. Um, I was talking about Kevin Hart not like. Like owning that what he said in a tweet years ago when he yeah. lost his you know um, position with the Oscars, but then apologizing a million times after that. Yeah. Do you recommend doing that? I think he apologized a little too much, but I think that he had to apologize too much because he wasn't authentic and sympathetic in his first apology. That it so then felt, he had to overcompensate. Yes. So I felt like, and then he also backed it up with, well. Um, I'm actually not going to do the awards <laughs> because I've already probably like it was from a place of boastfulness mm -hmm. um, and ego as opposed to really being humble. And people were pissed about that part. I don't think they were necessarily as mad that of what he said. I think it was the way that he came out and was very um, non, you know, unsympathetic mm -hmm. about what it is that he said in the way that he apologized, which made it cause a lingering reaction of people being still upset that you were the audacity of you to be like, well, I apologized years ago and I'm not going to do it again. So in a situation like that where you fall on your sword or you make a mistake in a relationship, um, in this case being with the public, you're saying apologize, but what's the best way to apologize? It's not multiple times, like you said, because then now you're having to overcompensate. How should you approach that I'm sorry conversation? I think you should really, for, for him or for people in, in that space, I think you really have to pick who you're going to do your real apology with. Mm. Like, you know how you have those um, Gail King moments. Like, <laughs> yeah. Really pick one and, like, divulge and give it. You know what I mean? And then that's it. You don't give any more. What about the social posts? The... Uh, I notes that you post to your Instagram of, I'm sorry that you guys feel this way. Like, is social media the best way to apologize? Sometimes. I mean, every day ain't going to get to Gail King or right, somebody Right, because I'm like, level, hey, realistically. Right? Um, 
it's okay to do a social media apology as long as it's empathetic. I mean, it's sympathetic, sorry. Um, it really just has to feel authentic. Um, but sometimes I feel like it's better to come from your voice mm -hmm. as opposed to like po writing something out and posting. Oh, so maybe it. it's, yeah, maybe it's a story or a video. Um, and that way people can kind of see your, your sympathy behind it, you know? Have you had a situation in your career where you fell on your sword and you had to repair and mend that relationship? Yeah. You got to <laughs> spill the juice. What happened? <laughs> Do I? It's a learning I, lesson I for us. Moved past it. It is a learning <laughs> lesson for us. You're supposed to use it as a testimony to mm -hmm. help us so that we can avoid that mistake and do better. Mm -mm, that's that fall. The sword ain't moved past it, girl. <laughs> we, I have fallen. The sword has stabbed, and we have moved past it. Oh, okay. That means it's real juicy. We're gonna have to. I'm gonna ask for this uh, when the cameras are off and the, <laughs> the mics are off. <laughs> but then, but you forgave yourself for it. You there was clearly something, an incident where it happened that you fell on your sword. Um, is there a more lighthearted incident where you have made a mistake that you couldn't share with us that you overcame or apologized for? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you don't have to give us a dirt, dirt one. I won't give you the dirt, dirt one. Um, I apologize all the time, like. Mistakes happen all the time. Like, either sometimes they're mistakes that I do mm -hmm. um, with our clients, or it's a mistake from my team members. And as a VP, I still have to apologize for them. So, um, I mean, it's I, I literally have to apologize. All the time. <laughs> Are people more receptive? You feel like to the apology instead of owning what you say and doubling down on it, do you feel like people are more warm and welcoming and forgiving when you apologize instead yeah. as opposed to being the bully and like, no, you're just going to take this? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I make it a point to like, I don't apologize for things that I don't think were wrong. Like, I apologize when I actually, if, if, you, if I take a step back and I say, you know what, I can see how they can say that or mm -hmm. I can see how they can feel hurt by that or how something went wrong and how... If, if I have any ownership or if my team members have any ownership in, that's when I'm like, okay, no, we actually should just apologize, you know? But if you're right and you're right and they're just being jackholes, mm -hmm. then I double down. Mm. So I'm not going to let you walk over us because that's not what's going to happen. But um, I think there's a, dif there's, there's a difference between standing your ground um, and knowing that you're right in something and really just being apologetic and saying, hey, you know, we've learned from this. We're going to be better. Yeah. And it won't happen again. Or we apologize for it. And we're just going to move on and move forward and be as positive as we can. Yes. And you've got to forgive yourself, too, for the mistake that you made. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. Accept my apology. I forgive myself. You should forgive me, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody's human. You know, nobody is without blame or have no mistakes. Yeah. Do you exercise this in your marriage? Because you are newly married, yes. new mother, congratulations. Are you practicing that same approach and apologizing when you should or you know, owning what you say and apologizing anyways in your own personal relationship? I do. Um, it might take me a little bit longer. <laughs> takes a little bit longer when you really love longer. the person and you want to kill them. <laughs> it's a little more nail biting sometimes, but yeah, I definitely, um, I, I believe in that. I believe in, in at least acknowledging when you're wrong and, um, even if it's just hurting someone's feelings, like I, I believe in acknowledging that and apologizing for it, even if you don't feel like you should or you yeah especially in relationships for me like in my marriage like it's really important that he feels supported and loved mm. and um honored yeah so i'm gonna make sure that if i did something wrong or if he views something that, that we're gonna talk about it and i'm gonna at least acknowledge what your feelings are and my part in that and always showing or making them feel as if they're respected. Yeah. Because they men go nuts when they don't feel respected. Us women too, but yeah. especially men, because we need to feel loved. They need to feel respected, like twenty four seven. Twenty four seven. Talk to me about you being this boss chick in the boardroom, and then you know in the bedroom as well. There's got to be like a crazy dynamic when you are, and we as 
alpha, you know, women that are in positions of power were, you know, bosses all day at work. Yeah. And then we come home and now we have to be a little bit softer, yeah. a little bit more <laughs> like, wait, he said, what? Do you know how many people I've been directing all day long? <laughs> Talk to me about that dynamic. How do you, are you turning the switch off and turning it on? Or is that something that you're still like working through? I'm still working through it. <laughs> um, my husband sometimes tells me, he'd be like, you are not at your office. <laughs> let I, her know, let I her know. I very, um, in my natural life, before I was a mom and before I was a wife, I was always demanding. Mm -hmm. So it definitely is something that, I'm conscious of and I think my friends and my family have been conscious of for most of my life so um in my marriage and being a mom and switching from the boardroom to the bedroom the bedroom <laughs> um yeah it's a challenge mm -hmm. it's a challenge a lot of women in like, positions of power deal with that it's a hard it's a hard pill because I you know you you move so fast and you have so many things going on and your cell phone's always going off and you have emails to respond to. And I'm transitioning now from maternity leave back to the office. So I'm like working from home for two days and in the office for three days. So the two days that I'm home, I'm still working. Mm -hmm. So I am really in work mode. So I'm really demanding and it's a little challenging. So I, I, I probably need your help with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, look, I know that that can be hard. I too have had to practice that. But if, but it's similar to what you're saying in regards to your professional, you know, endeavors and what you would instruct your, you know, clients to do, or even before, I know as a publicist, sometimes you have to tell your clients, like, take a beat before you address something, take yeah. a beat, like, stop process, think about what you're going to say, because you might not be able to reverse your reaction. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's the same thing when it comes to your relationship, even if they say something, ask them, well, what did you mean by that? Before I go off on you. Right. Because <laughs> if you make them repeat it, it gives an opportunity for them to now explain themselves because there may have been some misinterpretation mm -hmm. or you may be reacting, you know, in an emotional way when really it was something straightforward that you completely took the wrong way or maybe you're hypersensitive to that particular thing. Yeah. And we know our buttons when it comes to relationships. We know what's a push. And when the person isn't cognizant of that 24 seven, we feel now threatened or we feel like, well, the audacity, you know, that's a trigger for me, but people aren't perfect. Yeah. And so if you just always take a beat, ask the person, what did you mean by that? Before I respond to that, it saves a lot of arguments and time because now they do have to process what they say and now yeah. put it in different language that you can now receive. So just take that spicy tip right there. Just take a beat. Thank you, spicy. <laughs> But it is it is challenging because I'm bossy too. I'm gonna give I me, me and my husband both are actually very bossy, mm. and so we have to remember that we operate more peacefully at a place of kindness versus that every day like telling people what to do and how they should do it. Especially even as a coach, I prefer telling people what to do and getting results. Right. I like the same in my relationship too. Right. But that doesn't go over so smoothly when I'm telling him what he needs to be doing. Right. So there is some trial and error to it, too. Mm -hmm. But also, what about you checking in with your marriage? Have you tried that yet? The way that you would at work. So the way that you would with your, um, well, now that you're the boss, people are checking in with you. So people coming into you for the six-month review or people coming to you for the two-month mm -hmm. review, you know, how can I improve um, at my job? It's the same thing with your marriage. How can I improve mm -hmm. at your wife? Is there anything that maybe you need more of from me that I'm not recognizing? Point out my blind spots so that I can correct for it right now versus waiting until you blow up on me or it right. turns into an argument. Like literally just checking in to check in. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thanks. That is. So I get paid the big bucks, folks. Yeah. <laughs> it may throw them off like, wait, what did you do? But you guys should get in the habit of doing like monthly reviews with one another, not in a um, negative way, but in a like, hey, I love that you did this for me this month. I didn't show you enough appreciation. Yeah. Um, but I would also like for you to work on this. It makes me feel X, Y, and Z when you do it. It makes the person feel so cared for when you make them feel like their opinion matters in that relationship. Nice. Okay, Thanks, so you're going to use that one. Right. <laughs> now back to like the real PR. <laughs> that was just a little PR in your personal relationship. Thank you. But it's important because you are, you know, this this huge VP. A lot of us, especially with um, 
you know, and it's a, it's a whole episode is going to be dedicated to women who make more than their men or women who are in positions of power, that sometimes it can be, you know, threatening for someone who is your partner and especially, you know, that masculine and feminine energy sometimes being, you know, mm-hmm going toe to toe. But it's important for you to speak on that and show us that like it can be done. Like yeah. look at you're navigating and motherhood. Speak to us about the motherhood aspect really quick. How are you maintaining like being a mommy and a boss? Right. Because that almost seems near impossible and I'm afraid to do it. Oh. Um I'm really kind of like just kind of feeling like I'm getting into it. Mm-hmm. Um I would say it's not what I expect it to be. Mm. Um, what do you expect? I expected it to be, I think, a little smoother in terms of my transition back to work. Um, and how so? You thought you would want to go back, or you thought like I thought that work would be easier? It's not that I don't want to be back. Like I do want to be back, but your mind is like sometimes not all the way there, mm-hmm. there right? Like I've been had been out of work for almost six months, so. Um, it just was connecting my brain back to the the pace that it was supposed to be. And honestly, I was swirling for the first three weeks. Like I was swirling in emails and I just I, I just couldn't comprehend everything. And while I felt like um, it was time to be back at work mm-hmm. because I really had missed the work of it all, um, I still felt like my heart should still be with my son because Mm -hmm. I had this guilt of like not being home with him and um, not being able to spend time with him and and then coming home and feeling like my whole day is already gone Mm. and um, I only have this small amount of time with him left for the day until he goes to bed. You know, it's like four hours, right? So it it felt like guilt. Yeah. Um, So... What has helped me now is um, really kind of compartmentalizing um, and knowing that work time has to be really just focused hardcore on work. Mm -hmm. And the more that I get done there, the more time that I get to really be with my son. Oh, that's a good perspective. Yeah. So really focusing and not spending so much time on FaceTime with him (laughs) in the office or, you know, like really focusing on getting the work done so that when I come home, like I can turn that part of my brain off. What was the part in your life that you said, hey, I can stop and even take time to have a family? Because a lot of people in positions of power are afraid of leaving the work and things going awry when they're gone. And right. they, they put off motherhood, put off motherhood, put off motherhood. Yeah. What was the part where you were like, I'm ready. I can do this and still maintain my position, still carry the household. How did you know? Um, it was, it was, uh, it was a crapshoot, honestly. <laughs> uh, I had, I knew that my husband was going to be super supportive because that's just who he is. Like, he, like, really holds me down. So I knew that, um, and I knew my ovary was not getting any younger. Right. So time, right. time was a ticking. Um, and I imagined my life feeling like I missed this time, like, if I waited too long and I mm. missed the window and that was too much for me to bear. So I said, there are moms who have done it, yep. who have been single and who were financially challenged and still got it done. And I know I knew that I was strong enough to do that. And with all the support that I had mm-hmm. and being more financially stable that I could do it. And it might not be easy and it might not be as glamorous as your life was before. (laughs) You know, you cannot go by those purses. But I knew that in the long run, it would be worth it um, to not miss that window. So I decided to just jump. So you had to take a leap of faith. Yeah. Was there a conversation with him first? Are you kind of just like, so I'm going to have a baby tomorrow, FYI. I mean, we had said that we wanted to have a family. Um... And we wanted to do it sooner than later because Mm -hmm. both of us are, you know, inching towards 40. And um, he he already had a son. He was my stepson is 13. So the longer we waited, the more distance and and space and time that they had. I kind of yeah, Yeah. I wanted them to have some kind of bond and um, you know. And I just said, you know what? Let's just f and do it. Like we we both just decided to jump. 
you know? That's, I feel like, important that you jump together. That yeah. probably made you feel too more secure in doing it. It did. It did. Because I think if he was a little bit more hesitant or um, not as supportive, I probably would have hesitated more, too, you know? And I feel like even more, he was more supportive and more like, you got this yeah. than, than I could. And honestly, I got promoted when I was five months pregnant. Right. Can you <laughs> talk about that? Because I'm like, you weren't on maternity leave yet when you got promoted, but it was like right before you went on maternity leave? Yeah. So um, I was pregnant. Um, I didn't tell my job until I was probably like three or four months. Um, but I, I also was being heavily recruited by like competitors and like networks and stuff. And um, I was really nervous to go into um, my boss's office and, and say, hey, I'm being recruited. Um, I knew I wasn't going to go anywhere because I was pregnant. <laughs> but I'm being recruited, and um, I think this is a great time for us to talk about a promotion and a salary mm. increase. And the reason why I was nervous is because I was pregnant. And I was like, no one's going to promote me. I'm pregnant. Mm. And I can't really, like, I can do a job interview. And I did a job interview, and it was virtual. Like, I did, like, three virtual job interviews. But they didn't know I was pregnant. And it was like, people kept sending me jobs and stuff. And I was like, I can't go on job interviews. I'm pregnant. Because like, they're going to see the... They're going to see, like, that I'm pregnant, and they're not going to hire me or something. So I saw... So I, I just talked to my mentor and I was like, listen, I don't want to leave my job because I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and I, the worst thing I could do is like start a new career and be like pregnant and a new mom. Like I know that here I have a support system and here I, they know my value. So how do I make sure that they know my value and tell them that people are trying to get to me? Right. And see if I can get this promotion before I have this baby. Right. So oh, you had to be real strategic with it. I was so like smooth criminal right there. I had to be really strategic with it. And I think it just happened to be like a really great time that like people were like coming after me that I could be like, hey, by the way, mm -hmm. um, I you know that, that I'm leverage. Yeah, yeah I, I know that I'm pregnant and all, but. I could probably I'm highly I could drop after. this baby. I'm highly <laughs> sought after. So I can drop this baby and bounce. Or y'all can keep me here and I'll come back after maternity leave. Because, you know, my mentor originally was, she was like, oh, well, maybe you can just keep looking. And um, if you want to leave and you're getting offered all these positions or whatever, then um, wait until after you have the baby. And then mm -hmm. maybe look while you're on maternity leave. And I was like, I didn't really want to do that. My gut was telling me not to do that. So then she was like, well, then you have this route. Like, let's think of, let's think how through this. How we can maximize this. Yeah, yeah, how can we maximize this? So I would say um, the first thing was getting over the fear of going in and, and having them tell me no because I was pregnant. Um, because and, I do feel like that is looming over our head. Yeah, we do feel like, like it lowers our value or not what you're capable of, but more of we know that people are biased to that and right. don't see us as valuable because they think that because we're having kids that we're going to leave the job and we're not there. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I definitely had to reassure them that I was coming back after my maternity leave was over. But I knew that because they had given me this promotion and this raise that I was going to be coming back to an, a bigger and better opportunity for my family and that this place that I was at already was going to be fully supportive of me being a mom and a working mom here because they already knew my situation. Right. Um, and they were. And I was just really, really lucky. It sounds like you had to PR the heck out of your <laughs> career, Girl. too, like yes. within your own company. You do. See, that's... She's an expert, you guys. She's an expert. Okay, so she has to get back to her family, yes. get back to her baby. So we have to wrap up the show. And she has given us some amazing gems right here. Jamila has dropped on you um, not just how to PR your professional life, but how to PR your personal life as well. <laughs> some of y'all should be getting promotions after this. Um, but we always wrap up the show with the naked truth. And so I have to ask you a couple of spicy questions before you get out of here. Okay. If you could have any superpower in the world, what would it be? Ooh, superpower in the world. I think knowledge is power. So I think I would have um, a big brain. 
a, well, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I already have a, it's all right. It's, the size is okay. Like um, I got a big head, I got a big head. I think too. I would have like some type of, of telepathy or intuition mm. to like see things into the future. I feel like you already do that. Yeah. For your job. <laughs> so you just want to maximize, expand it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, like Dr. Xavier? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. If you could travel back in time and relive any one moment that you enjoyed or loved or experienced, what point back in time would you go to in your life? I would go back to my wedding because it was a blur. Oh. I mean, it was a great, great time. And I feel like I was as present as I could be at that moment. It's so but hard, But it was though. like an out-of-body experience, and it cost so much money. <laughs> I not was, remember it. Right. <laughs> To be stressed out. Okay, yeah, we're going to have to watch that video footage then <laughs> to relive it. And then last but not least, if you could swap bodies with any one person mm -hmm. uh, just for the day, just a body swap, who would it be? Just physical body, Just physical right? body. You just live that person's life for the day. I don't know if I want to live her life, but I do want to live in her body. Nicole Murphy. Ooh, dang. <laughs> her Nicole body Murphy's so body trash. is everything. Dang, she has like what, six, five or six kids? Yeah. That's, it's almost humanly impossible. I'm like, that's, no, she's not from yeah. this planet. No. I think that's how you can identify to uh, extraterrestrials. Because um, <laughs> that is impossible. And she always just seems she so happy. Amazing. Too. You're right. Okay. That's a good one right there. <laughs> okay. Let everybody know like where they can find you if they want your services, if they want to reach out to you, if they have any PR questions. Give us that little nugget right there. Um, how can people contact you? Well, I'm not up for services because I'm busy, but <laughs> look, but um, she's in high unless demand. you have a film project or a television project or I don't know. Maybe um, your social media. We my can tweet social media. You. Yes, I, I am available to, to talk to people and, and have people learn because I feel like knowledge is power. And I want to empower especially people of diverse backgrounds to um, really empower themselves to help their businesses grow. So um, you can reach me. What is my my? My Instagram is jam on it oh nine. That's the thing I You're check the most. Get a lot of DMs because she you, she told you earlier <laughs> slide through DMs. You're about to get hundred DMs. DMs. <laughs> jam on it oh nine. Um, and then I don't really use Twitter that much. I think that's really probably the best way to reach me. Um, yeah, because I don't. Technically, she doesn't have time for you because she's building an empire and raising a family, and yeah. But um, <laughs> you make it. Lucky. You can shoot your shot. <laughs> shoot your shot. There you go. All right, you guys, thank you so much. Uh, you can play with my Twitter and stroke my Instagram at SpicyMati. Make sure you go to thespicylife.com and also download this episode, share it with a friend, uh, give it to a loved one, and there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.